Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's our user groups session at the Harvard Data Science Initiative. I'd like to introduce Albert Rapp, who will be talking about HTML and CSS for our users today. Um, Albert is a math PhD student specializing in probability theory. He is passionate about R, data visualization, Shiny, and web development. He shares his latest findings and knowledge with the community through his personal blog, Twitter, and YouTube. Today, we'll be talking about popular R tools like GT, GGText, Shiny, and Quarto, and how you can upgrade those with a little bit of HTML and CSS. So without further ado, go ahead, Albert. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for this nice introduction. Let me start by sharing my slides. I think you can see it okay. Let me get rid of the notification on my laptop screen. Okay, perfect. So thanks for the invite. I'm very happy to talk about R and especially HTML and CSS for R users, because really this is not something I get to do in my main job. So let me talk a little bit about me before we start. Um, I'm a math PhD student from Germany, and I specialize in theoretical probability. But today's talk won't be about anything about probability theory, and will only be about R and HTML and CSS. I am also a content creator and a freelancer. And as Christian just said, I share what I learn online. I mainly use Twitter, my blog, or recently YouTube to share to share my content just yeah I just like to share what I learn and using using my blog and sharing this I also learn a lot more so this is, has also been a vehicle for learning more about the content that I actually teach and it's the same thing with HTML and CSS I haven't actually learned it like a long time ago but I tried to figure things out and then I shared it on my blog and I think this probably makes for a unique perspective to share with our users because I'm not an expert. I know what, still know what people struggle with. In any case, let me just mention that I also have a weekly newsletter. If you want, you can also subscribe there. Same thing, I just share every week what I think is interesting, what I think can be useful for the R community, especially if you're into Dataverse or shiny web development or just web development in general. Okay, so, so much about me. Let's talk about why we should even care about HTML and CSS, why we should learn it as our users. It really is easy to think that HTML and CSS is just something people on the web, develop, on the web development side of things just do, just like to use, and our users are into the data analysis, and we don't really need HTML and CSS. But the thing is that so many packages that we like to use in R that are really popular, they are at some point using HTML or CSS or are very specifically built on top of these technologies. And of course, this means that you don't necessarily totally need them all the time. But if you know a little bit about these two languages, then you can go even beyond what these R packages enable you to do. So let's start by looking at a couple of examples. Here you see a data visualization from the Parma Penguins package in R. You've probably uh, already seen it before. This is like the typical test package or test data set that people in the R community like to work with. And here you see just a couple of measurements like the bill length and the flipper length. It's just a very easy scatter plot. And we have colorized the uh, points in the scatter plot according to whether the penguins are male or female. The interesting thing about this here is that this data visualization encodes the color by colorizing the words in the title. Often you find like in the standard GG plot um, output, you will find that there is a legend and on the right hand side, and this will just take up a lot of space and this way the data will have less room to breathe to show itself so this is why people usually like to 
of, or not usually, but often like to color code the titles so that it is easy to see which color represents what, but you don't need a very big uh, legend for this. And if you want to create something like this with R, there is ggtext, which is basically an extension to ggplot, which helps you to do it. So once again, it's easy to think that, well, if there is ggtext, then why would I need HTML and CSS to figure this out? But if you look at the code, then you will see that there are two things you will have to do. First, you have to change the theme to enable element markdown, which also enables HTML and CSS. And then you will have to set the title label to something which includes these span tags that you see here. So this means that even though it is an R package, it requires you to use the span tags, which is really just HTML and CSS code to get the job done. So this is one very easy example. Another example is the GT package. It is a very great package to create tables. And I think recently there is version 0 0.9 uh, released. And it's a very great package to do all kinds of tables. And it is built specifically on HTML and CSS. You can notice it if you use it in our studio that it is, that it is shown in the viewer window. And if you click the small icon, then it will open up in your browser and you can interact like it is just any web page. This already shows you that this is built on HTML and CSS. And here you have an example of um, a GT table that is enhanced by things that haven't been implemented in GT itself in the R package, but um, with help of CSS, which is really powerful. What I mean is the color gradient in the background here. I mean, it is a fancy thing to do here. It is not like totally necessary for this part, but it just goes to show that you can go way beyond what GT can offer you as an R package by just allowing you to directly include CSS. So the code for this is you don't have to understand this at all yet. You just have to realize that the function just takes a GT table that you, you would usually um, create with GT, and then you pass it to opt CSS, which will just let you put in CSS directly into the table. And once you can create a little bit of CSS, even though if you don't understand this yet, the idea is clear. Once you figure out the CSS code, you can go way beyond what R has already implemented. This will help you to build your own, I call it fancy elements. Right now it's only circles. It is really just a visual cue for the numbers that you see here. But the point is you can do anything that CSS offers which is really a lot. There is a lot of fancy stuff you can build with it and you can put it directly into GT once you figure out how the CSS works. And for this particular table, it's very easy to create this. In fact, this is what I'm going to show you today. This doesn't require you to know a lot of CSS. I will just guide you through the process of figuring this out. Of course, another example for the usefulness of CSS is Shiny. If you don't know Shiny, it is a package that helps you to create web apps so that users who may not be familiar with your data analysis or with coding in general can just see your data, interact with your data through a nice user click and uh, point and click interface where non-coders can basically enjoy your data analysis too. And the way you create such a user interface in Shiny is that you just put in functions like, in this case, the action button, which will, you probably guessed it, create a button that um, a user then can click on. And the really nice thing about the button and all kinds of other Shiny user interface elements is that you can inject CSS directly into the call whenever you need it. And sure, this isn't 100% necessary, but as we all know, if an app doesn't feel good, if it doesn't look good, then people will just not use it. Doesn't matter what amazing theory you have behind your data analysis, people will just not use it. 
So it is indeed important if you want to get your data analysis out there to have things look nice. And you don't need to do a huge ton of styling. There are packages that help you um, use custom fonts, custom themes, and so on very easily. But it helps to know that whenever you feel like it, you can just take a couple of CSS keywords like you see here and put them into the style argument of your UI function. And if you look at the code here, you will obviously see that this isn't rocket science. You can figure it out well what these three things do. So it isn't really hard to include these CSS things. You just have to figure out what are the keywords that I need. And these are the kind of things that you can very easily learn, but that will help you go beyond the things that our packages gives you. And moving on more broadly from our packages, but still very popular R tools is Corto. I like to call it a web development gateway drug because it allows you to do so much things without having to think about web development. I mean, you can create reports, slides, or blogs. This is what I use to get my content out there. And you don't have to think a single second about, well, what is the HTML behind this? How does this work? Quarto is kind of magical in that sense. It just does things for you. But if you're anything like me, then at some point you will think, maybe I can tweak this a little bit. Maybe I can just, on my slide, move the uh, image to the top left corner or add some fancy element or do some other weird stuff that the web development community has already figured out. And the cool thing with Quarto is that you can do all of the things because at the end, it will just give you plain HTML and CSS. And once you know a little bit about these two languages, then you can put in your what you want to do in there as well. And the easiest way to do that in Quarto is to just use the SCSS file, which is a CSS file, but nicer. Just think of the S as super CSS if you want. I don't think this is the correct translation, but in any case, it is like CSS, but a little bit better in the sense that you can work with variables like these. You can declare them with a dollar sign. And here, because Quarto uses the so-called bootstrap um, um, framework in the background, you can style a lot of things. If you want to change anything, just look into the list online in the Quarto documentation, what variable changes what. For instance, the primary variable will change the primary color in your blog. The nav, nav bar BG color or the variable will change the background color of the nav bar. Same, same thing with the FG variable, it will change the foreground color and so on. So you can do a lot of things by just creating a theme.scss file and then just naming these variables if you want. So you can do a lot of customization there. So this part is technically using CSS, but really you don't have to understand it at all. You can just customize a lot from your blog, from your report, or from your slides by changing these variables simply by calling them and setting them to whatever value you want. That's pretty neat. But when you want to do even more, then you can try to figure out how CSS works by applying rules to it. And what you see here are just three very basic rules that target very specific things on your website or your slide or your report or your shiny app and change their style. And the way to target this, these specific elements that you want to change is through a combination of IDs, which are um, labeled by a hashtag or via dots, which, um, um, which will um, denote classes that you want to change. And once you figure out how to create this combination of classes and IDs, then you can just once again figure out a couple of keywords like font family, font size, um, margins, and change the thing that you want to change. So really, it comes down to figuring out how do I know what I want to change? And the great thing about Quarto is that it already generates so much HTML and CSS code for you that you only need to figure out how to go into that code 
and then copy and paste the specific description that you see here and then just change the stuff it's really not not that complicated you can do a lot of things with figuring out where to look copy and pasting and then changing uh, very tiny things and this is what i want to show you in the next part of this uh, talk so here you see um, one of my blog posts this is currently um, the version of my blog that is online and this is actually this is another um, neat use case of um, html and css this is the ggref package it allows you to create interactive gg plots um, from from within r but it's the same thing at some point you will have to um, figure out um, what is the CSS that I need to inject here so that it indeed looks interactive like I want it to. Okay, so this is uh, a blog post all generated from Quarton. And once you want to change something, you can, you can do this on any website. You can just right click anywhere and then press the inspect button and it will automatically open up the web developer view don't be alarmed this looks really um confusing at first so the first thing you want to do and this is something i have to do for this presentation so that you can see is increase the font size so that you can actually read it very well let me check i think now you should be able to see should be legible if not just give me uh give me a yeah just let me know if you can read it okay so you can click anywhere can click anywhere and press uh, press inspect in my case i like to just press q and then it will automatically jump to the part of the corresponding html code and the first thing you have to understand about html and css is that everything is a box you can see here on the left hand side that we currently uh, have this paragraph highlighted and as i move my cursor through the code a different part of the code or of the website is highlighted but whenever you see it it is always a box and even if you go into these paragraphs like here you can unfold this code even if you go through these parts of the paragraphs even in line it is just boxes so fundamentally if you want to change the style of your page you just have to figure out the correct box that you want to change and then apply the keywords for example we could just take this box here and then we can go into this element here and say maybe we want to have the color be red the moment i typed this in the text became red this is really neat about the really neat thing about html and css and especially about learning it is that you immediately see if things worked or didn't so you cannot do anything wrong you just try it out and if it didn't work nothing really happened you could also change the font weight to bold or instead of bold you could write 600 doesn't doesn't really matter okay so ideally uh, so at the bottom at the fundamentally this is how HTML and CSS work. You just write the styles into the elements you want to change. Here, I've directly written it into this paragraph, which is why only that paragraph changed and not all of them. But one thing you may have noticed is that these code chunks here that are inside of the inline code, they didn't change color. They became bold, but they didn't change color. And the thing you need to understand to figure out why this didn't happen is specificity whenever you want to change something you have to give the most specific description that you can find for that element and if there is something that is more specific then it will override whatever you want to change and this is exactly what is going on here if you click into this um, code tag here this is a different code tag then you will see if you scroll down here, you will see that there is a description for all code tags that their color should be, well, this kind of blue. And this means that even though my code tag is inside of the paragraph that I've just made red, 
it will not be affected. This code part will not be affected because there is a more specific instruction telling this part to stay this bluish color. But we could disable it. We could just take out the check mark here, and then we would see, okay, the code now is is red. That's basically how it works. And now, if you wanted to change the appearance of your website, you could just take this. This is the currently the most specific description of the thing that you want to change, and you could put it to your R Studio file. This is your theme. Dot .scss file, copy it in there, and then just change the color to, I don't know, we could invert color and background. So once that is saved, we have changed the appearance of our website. And as I said, it's really not hard to do it. You just have to figure out what is the most specific um, description of the thing that I want to change. And once you have figured that out, just copy and paste it and then change it. And one thing you have to watch out here or things you have to understand is that we have seen tags now that can be more specific than the paragraph which the tag is contained in. But we can also do more specific things. Notice, for example, we have changed the color of codes now. It should be red, but the color of the code that is inside of this box is completely unaffected by what I did before. So we have to figure out what is going on there. And the way to do it is once again, just go there, what you want to figure out and inspect it. Then you will be taken to the code and you see here this GREF call. My code is red, not only in the code, in a code tag, it is in a code tag, but it's also wrapped inside of a span tag, which is once again has another span tag inside it, which contains a class fu. I have no idea what fu stands for, but the point is just things that you generate with Quarto or in, with HTML in general are so nested into each other that it's hard to figure out from just looking at the website what is the code? What is the thing that I need to target? So you have no other choice but to use the web inspector. But once you have done that, you can just click on this element and it will tell you the most specific description here is not only code, but the code where inside of it is a span tag that uses a class called fu. This dot means class. And this is what you also see here in this span tag in there. And if you wanted to change this uh, specific class, then you could just change it to something like this. If you like this color, then once again, you could just take this part here, paste it to your theme.scss file, and you have successfully changed your block appearance. And you could do this for all uh, different kind of classes as well. For example, these things that are colored like in this brownish, greenish color, they seem to have the class AT. So once you figure out, well, AT is the class that I need to target, same thing, just change um, the code here and then copy and paste it to your theme file. So with classes, we can get more specific than just text. And there's one thing you need, uh, one additional thing that you need to understand before you can just, um, before you know more or less everything you need to know, is that there cannot only be classes, there are sometimes also IDs. For example, if I look at my blog code, I have these tags here, which um, describe which categories this blog post belongs to. So in this case, I have added the tags, shiny interactive plots and visualization. Doesn't really matter what they say, the point is, if we want to change the appearance of this, we once again have to figure out what is the most specific description of this, and we just inspect it. And then we will see that this part here is the most specific description. The most specific description is always on top, but you will sometimes also have to check lower levels to see what other part may change. You can see here that in the 
um, web developer, you see other properties are overwritten by the more specific description. But um, in any case, just take this part and then you can um, copy and paste it. And the really only thing I want to show you here is that you can have stuff like hashtag and then a name which corresponds to the IDs that you have here. So this is an even more specific way to describe the things that you have in HTML and CSS. Okay, and this is the story about HTML and CSS. This is what you need to know. The little thing, there is a lot more to know about these two languages, but the very minimum you need to know is that there are tags, they can be nested inside of each other, and you can think, make things more specific by classes and IDs. And once you know that, you can just target these things and apply the correct keywords to make them look good or however you want them to look. Okay, so to um, make good on my promise that we're going to build a, a GT table with these dots inside of them, let us build a little bit of HTML now. You can, on any website, you can just go to wherever, just press inspect. And then, for example, we could change this whole HTML code. This is not a great way to interact with HTML with websites. It's really tedious to change stuff here. And especially if you reload the website, it will all go away. I will talk about tools that you can use later on, but I just want to uh, show you what we can do here. And really what I want to do is that I want to add span tags. These are the inline tags that we can use to yeah, write stuff in line. And here we want to use it to create these dots. So once we have added this code, we can see here that there is a span tag here. There's, right now there's nothing in there. So let me maybe put some content in there. The thing about span tags is that they won't show up if they're empty, at least by default. So let's put in a word in there. And there you see it on my website now. And let's, um, now that we have the code in here, we can just style this element. And the first thing we want to do is we want to have colored dots. So we might as well color these span tags here, just change whatever color we want. Maybe we want to have it blue, violet. Then we don't want to, um, color the whole row, maybe we'll just say the width of this is 30 pixels. And we could also say that the height of this is also 30 pixels. And what you see here, oh, I, have, I have to write 30 pixels. If it will let me, 30 pixels. So we have a um, rectangle now. So let us just get rid of the text now. Mm -hmm. Classic demo problem. Let me just edit this one here. Shouldn't add a white space. In any case, usually if I'm not doing a presentation like this, it will complain that it cannot display this, this element here. The reason this works is because we've had, maybe if we change this to 40 pixels, it will work then. No. So right now everything looks as it should, but what you will notice is that when you do this at home, you will notice that this span text cannot just appear on their own. So what you will usually do, and this is really what I wanted to show in this demonstration, is that your um, web inspector will show you that you cannot um, change the width and height of span tags if the display isn't set properly. And what we want here is that it is displayed as an inline block. And then things just work. This is something you have to usually um, um, get in there. And then we have a nice block now. Let's make it round. So let's change border radius and set this to 
Okay, and now we have a nice circle. And since we want to have multiple circles, we can just put this in there. And then we see that they are below each other instead of next to each other. <laughs> this is weird. Technically, since they are in line, let me just restart this. Classic problem with a demo. So we'll add a span pack. This one is empty. With to 30 pixels. Height to 30 pixels and the background color to blue violet. And now, if we copy and paste this, it should be next to each other. Fingers crossed. Of course, it doesn't work. Okay, I have no idea what's going on. But it doesn't doesn't really matter. These things apparently happen in live demos, which is why people say don't do live demos. Things can go wrong. I figured it wouldn't, but it did. In any case, usually they are next to each other. And once you have that, it doesn't really matter if they are next or uh, above each other. You want to space them out a little bit. And what you do is you can add margins to like, I don't know, two pixels. This will do margins to all sides now, which is really what we need since we have them on top of each other. But we could also just say, I want to add margin at the bottom. And then we could also make five pixels or whatever. And what you see here is that once again, it is just a matter of figuring out the correct keyword, playing around with what you uh, inside of the web inspector and once you're satisfied with the result you just take this code here either for quarter you would just take the description but since we want to build a table with gt now you would just take this code here copy and paste it and then pass it to r so let's do that now so what you would do is you would go from your web inspector you would go to your R Studio to build this table now. And you would just take the code and drop it into a character vector. This is really what I did here. I have taken the code that we have just written and put them into a, a character vector. And now we can work with it. Since we want to create a fake data set. We, I've just made something up. I've created a couple of grades, a couple of numbers of students. And then I have used the wrap function to repeat this HTML text a couple of times, as many times as I needed for the students that I have. And then I have, wrap will create a vector. Then I have just um, copy and paste, uh, a col a collapsed it to one, to one text. And then, um, we have a one HTML text for each one. And once you have the HTML, it's just with GG text, just pass it to GT and enable markdown for that specific column. And then you have exactly what you want. So that is how you can just use your web inspector to figure out the HTML just by uh, copy and pasting trial and error. And once that is done, take what you want to your theme.scss file in Corto, or take it to GT or take it to wherever. It really is the, if you don't want to do a lot of uh, web development stuff, just using the web developer, uh, this, this whole view and inspecting stuff is the most powerful thing you can do. And it can teach you so much. And that's also how you learn these keywords. Of course, you don't know how the keywords are supposed to be when you start out, but when you find other websites online, you can always just check with the net, uh, with the inspector. Hey, what kind of keyword do they use to make the 
borders round or how do they do the spacing? This is something you can figure out this way. And this is really a trial and error process that you can use to enhance these couple of things that are not yet implemented in R with a little bit of HTML and CSS. So let's talk resources. The first thing I want to mention is something that is doesn't really have anything to do with R, but it is still a very nice um, way to learn these HTML and CSS keywords. Because I figured out that learning these two languages is really mostly about learning these keywords. And the best way to learn these keywords is to just watch someone who is already fluent with, with HTML and CSS build something. And one thing that I have learned personally a lot from is this video from Adrian Twarog, who is building the website uh, that you see on the right side of the screen in real time. So what he's showing you in that video is to build a complete website within, what is it, one hour. Um, and once this one hour is over, you have learned so many keywords and so many strategies to figure out how to make what you want to create with HTML and CSS. Won't be perfect, will still be a lot of trial and error, but at least you have a, a clue of where to look, what to try. So this is really not an R theme thing, but it will still give you a lot of um, a lot of ideas what what to try on your R journey with HTML and CSS. One thing you do have to know here is that this guy uses Tailwind CSS, which is a specific form of CSS which doesn't do anything with specific styles like I did before. We have always just added styles um, to specific elements. Tailwind CSS just has a lot of classes defined and adds these classes. So if you want to get rounded corners, then you won't do border <laughs> radius, but you will add the rounded XL or rounded LG or rounded SM. So you can have small, large, or a very large uh, rounded corners to add this specific CSS class. To, to your code and will do exactly the same job. But the nice thing about this is you can do so much more done in a shorter time and you learn a lot more. This is the main advantage I personally have seen from Tailwind CSS. I was always too lazy to type out all the CSS commands and to try them out. I wasn't even trying them because I was too lazy to maybe it doesn't work with Tailwind CSS. It's really just a shorthand and it just works and you can try things easier. What you will see in that video is that uh, he uses VS Code and just by pressing save, the whole website will reload. And if you want to try out something with HTML and CSS, I recommend that you do the same. What you need for that is to uh, install VS Code, install the extension Tailwind CSS Intelligence, which is really just a helpful tool that will describe these C Tailwind CSS classes, what they do in translated to standard CSS. And this is, for me, this was one of the things that helped me learn regular CSS so that I can use it everywhere by seeing these very convenient classes. And once I've used them a couple of times, I know how they work, but with IntelliSense, with this extension, I can always look up what is the regular code, and I've learned this uh, faster this way. And then you also need the live server um, extension that will open up a website. So whenever you press save, you see the changes immediately. And this is really the fastest way to learn how to code with HTML and CSS. Working in, with the web inspector and trying things out is fine. It is, it is also very fast. But once you do more and you want to type a lot of things, then don't try to do it all in our studio. I really love our studio and I use it for all of the things, R, Quarto, and so on. But for everything else, just go to VS Code and I know that it can feel frightening. I have used VS Code only for a couple of months now and the, the start is really rough. You have to figure, figure out how to deal with it. 
which makes it really daunting, but it really is worth the effort just so that you can work um, nicely with these extensions and you can learn faster. You don't ever have to open it up again later once you figured out what are the 10 to 50 CSS classes I need all the time, and then you can just use them in regular R Studio or CSS. Okay, so this is non-R related, and but it's still, this is the cool thing about HTML and CSS. Since it, is, it isn't really an R focused thing, you have the whole um, literature or the whole internet full of helpful tips on HTML and CSS that will help you um, to figure things out. You are not only restricted to looking for how do I change something in Quarto. You will probably not find the result because Quarto is new. But if you look for how do I change the same thing in HTML and CSS, you will probably find a ton of Stack Overflow um, reports or whatever. So you have the whole HTML and CSS literature at your disposal once you try to work natively in these two languages. Another resource that I've recently found, which I am not very familiar with, but they have, it looks very decent, is the web.dev website. That's really just the URL, web.dev. And once you're there, you can figure out all the, learn all the basics of HTML and CSS. And there's also something about accessibility. So it looks like a really great resource. I just wanted it to mention it for completeness sake. And one more resource, which is more R themed, in fact, it is Shiny themed, is the free ebook Outstanding User Interfaces with Shiny, which I think is a, also a very great introduction to all of these little HTML and CSS things you need to get you further in your R journey in this case for your shiny journey, but the knowledge translates to everywhere where you want to use HTML and CSS. So these were the resources. Thank you. Ah, I almost forgot. I have games for you. I was about to say uh, thank you and goodbye, but I have two more resources for you. I have uh, the CSS dinner, which is really a game um, that will help you to figure out how do these classes, IDs, and so on. How do these play together to figure out the correct way to select the most specific thing that you want to select? I mean, this is something you only have to do when you get tired of always having to go to the inspector, copy and pasting the most specific instruction, and then just changing stuff there. If you actually want to understand what is the structure, why is it the way it is, then the CSS dinner is just a fun game that can help you to practice CSS selectors with bento boxes in this case. And another one is uh, the Flexbox Tower Defense. Um, it's a little game that will help you to arrange stuff uh, on a website, which is surprisingly very hard to do. It, uh, if you ever try to figure out how to center a line the, the container, then you will know that this is very painful if you have no idea what's going on. At some point, you realize that one solution to this is Flexbox, but then you have to figure out how Flexboxes work. And the way I learned it was to just play this little, let's call it rudimentary game, but it worked. So I'm not saying this is the perfect um, resource for learning Flexbox, but for me, it was just a fun interactive way to learn how to align things so that in this case the towers are near the line where the monsters come and then you win the game that's uh, more or less the objective of that game okay so that indeed was the final resource that i want to mention so thanks for having me thanks for uh, watching and i'm happy to answer any questions that you have Thank you so much, Albert. This has been a really excellent presentation. You covered so many things that I feel like I either use myself or see other people using. Um, and I just think you've done an excellent job of demystifying so many aspects of working with HTML and CSS that our users, 
you know, have, but often don't know how to articulate that what they don't know how to do, you know, especially around opening up inspector tools, um, you know, developer tools, that's something that you kind of need to see done for you before you even know that it's an option out there. And so I'm really glad you incorporated that in our talk. And then there were things that were totally new for me. I had no idea you could just copy CSS out of inspector tools like that. That's going to simplify my life in so many ways. Um, there were there was at least one question I saw in the chat earlier that I wanted to make sure um, you got. And that was, do you recommend using fixed or relative font sizes, as in like pixels or EM units? Do you have any recommendation there? It will probably be better if you use relative font sizes. Honestly, I usually stick to the defaults, whatever um, Quarto or Tailwind CSS gives me. So I I can't give you a detailed answer on in which cases maybe fixed is better than relative. Yeah. Um, but my guess would be to that when in doubt, use relative so that it scales well for small and large screens. This is actually a very tricky thing that you have to watch out for with HTML and CSS. Once you have a website, people will want to just look at it on their phone, but the phone behaves, the screen is so small, it will be troublesome if your website doesn't adjust for this. Quarto can do a lot of these things too, um, but I just haven't mentioned it here because I wanted to have it um, to be like very introductory. If you're into these things, then it's responsive design. This is the keyword you are looking for. If you want to make your website look good on small and big screens. Um, I see one more question in the chat and that's, they're saying, I've seen a few options with blog down using Hugo themes for personal websites. They've tried one or two themes, but they find it's difficult at times or overwhelming. Did you say you used Quarto for your own blog and does Quarto provide templates as well? Uh, I, I use Quarto for my blog, definitely, yes. Um, there are themes, yes, there are. Of course, there are themes for this. Um, I'm not sure if I did this for my blog. You can do both. You can you can do a theme, and once you're happy with the general thing, but want to tweak a little bit, a, a couple of things, then you can still add these this theme.scss file on top of that. But I think there are like twelve predefined themes um, for this. So it's what I really enjoy about Quarto that it's really easy to get started. I mean, you can spend a million of hours trying to make things look very cool, very nice, but at the very core, the very basic thing is you can just take the default or one of the predefined themes, and then it's just go time. You can just focus on your content. But probably the Hugo themes that there are will be fancier. They will have more fancy and super cool visual elements. If these are the things you're looking for, then I'm not so sure that Quarto has something predefined for you. Then you may have to check if there is a Quarto extension for this, or if you can build something like this on your own. Oh, there's another question in the chat. You showed an action button call with a style argument. Do you know which style, which shiny elements accept a style argument? Is it accepted by any functions that take the dots argument? Yes, yes, mostly I, um, I wouldn't bet money on this, but I am quite, uh, sh quite sure that all of the um, UI elements that accept the dot, dot, dot will accept the style argument. In fact, this is what it says in the documentation. I, I thought it, was, it wasn't well documented, but at some point actually bothered reading the documentation and I figured out it literally says if the dot 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 has a named argument, it will be used for the tags in the HTML. And so if you say style is equal to this argument that you're using is named style. So you're using style inside of the HTML tag. And I, you can always check if that is the case for the UI function that you want to use. Um, probably most of them will have something like this. 
I think I've seen the same little, you know, obscure line in the documentation you have. And as an aside, I think it can be useful for setting things like ID equals mm -hmm. or something. Like exactly that the same CSS thing. Text. Yes, it is exactly the same. You are then using the ID argument to uh, as yeah. a name, and then it will be used as a thing in the HTML tag. I had a question of my own, which is, um, you know, I really, what you were saying about finding people on YouTube who are already fluent with CSS really resonated for me. For example, you know, I found when I started watching um, Tidy Tuesday, you know, screencasts, especially yes. from Julia Silgi, it's one of the situations where she's already familiar with tidy mm -hmm. models and things like that. So I learned that are my so main much. two resources for learning are as well. First, the uh, right. uh, Tidy Tuesday screencast and then Julia Silgi for tidy models. Right. And so, um, you know, you mentioned Adrian Twyrog for that one video around HTML and CSS. I was just wondering if you had any other you know, YouTubers that you would recommend above and beyond them? Hmm. Honestly, I, I, I don't really know what Adrian does beside this video. I think he does okay. a lot of HTML stuff like this too, um, but I've really just found this one. And this yeah. this one hour video was a treasure trove for me. I have okay. just, whenever I know, I think he has done something like this on the website, just go to that video. But I've recently also started watching the uh, Hyperplexed, um youtube channel which okay. is um it is really great i wouldn't really use it as a learning resource but as a getting inspired resource but because the videos yeah. are so great and it's so smooth and the things he's creating just look fantastic afterwards this is just something that will inspire you i want to do the same maybe i can just tweak yeah. my stuff a little bit too and there's one very famous one i forgot his name but I'm also following him. He's also doing Kevin Powell. Is that his name? Okay. I I, I think that that's the name, something like this. I can, in any case, I can send you a, a link later on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll try to include, you know, all the links that are showing yeah. up in the chat and stuff like that in the description on the YouTube exactly. when we post this. Um, yeah. I had another question of my own, which is one of the things that kind of makes me want to tear my hair out sometimes when I'm fussing with CSS selectors in in Shiny or, or something like that, is when I need to use the important tag. Because sometimes I find I, I just can't make the CSS do what I want it to until I realize, oh, maybe there's something that's overriding this and I need to put important on my own tag. I often feel like surely I'm doing this the wrong way, you know, when I have to use that. But is that right? Is there a better way for me to use, you know, important or or to is it just that I need to do it in a style sheet? I'm I'm never quite certain about that. I I can't really tell you, but I what I can tell you is that I'm ex at the exact same problem right now, and I haven't decided on a solution yet because okay. I want. I've built my new landing page for pure HTML and CSS, but I'm using Quarto for everything else. And Quarto is overwriting a couple of things, even though I've set it to theme none, which shouldn't do anything because it uses important. And now I'm at a crossroad. Do I use important too, or do I figure something else out? I can right. probably give you an answer in like two weeks or so. Okay, I would love an update whenever you have it, but it's actually really just comforting to hear that this is where you're at as well, uh, because it makes me feel like I'm not missing something super obvious. So that's really helpful. I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, we have a couple minutes until noon, but uh, it was just a really fantastic presentation again. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was just nice being here talking about HTML and CSS. And a lot of people showed up too. I'm really happy that so many people are interested in learning about these two technologies. Yeah, I don't know if you saw in the chat, but especially as we were starting, there were a lot of people saying that this Zoom was really timely, that this meeting was really timely for them, that they were looking forward to it that they've seen your content in the past and found it super useful. So I think there was a lot of uh, really, you know, positive anticipation for this. Awesome, that's very, that's very nice to hear. <laughs> All right, well, I don't think there are any more questions or at least I'm not seeing them in the chat. 
So um, let's go ahead and sign off for today. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll let you know when we have another event on the books. All right. So thanks for having me. And see you next time, hopefully. <laughs>